these are the elements of the grant that we're working on right now. So the first thing we did was we issued a PLP survey to our member libraries to talk about the news literacy needs in the Bay Area. All of our communities are very diverse and we wanted to make sure that we understood what the needs are. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about when I say news literacy, fake news, fake news. So that's what we're talking about. Um, I hate that phrase, fake news. You can talk to me later if you wanna know why. Um, but, and then the other thing we did, we did this last week. We held a regional meeting with um, public and academic librarians. We had journalists there, we had the media there, there were about 50 of us. And it was, it was a really amazing conversation about news literacy. And what I really saw was that the academic librarians are way ahead of us already in the programming uh, uh, that they're doing for their students and faculty around news literacy. And I think it's pretty not, it's, Quite often we don't see that crossover between academic and public librarians, but the synergy that was happening there was really amazing. We had journalists there and people from San Jose State, uh, the, or excuse me, San Francisco State Journalism School. Um, and it was, it was a great synergy um, and conversation about w what partnerships can we make and where can we go around future programming um, around news literacy. Um, and then we're going to be creating a news literacy working group who is going to create, guess what, another toolkit. So this will be a toolkit that you all will be able to use in your libraries around news literacy. And it will give you tips and some par partnerships that you can develop. So those are the goals that we're hoping to have from this. So um, I want to talk for just a minute about data. I love data. And so this, uh, the Pew Research just did, uh, they released this study earlier this uh, summer called How People Approach Facts and Information. So I think that this actually validates uh, what this grant is all about. So if you look at the um, vertical, um, the, they categorize people on how much uh, they trust news, like what category do you fall into? So on the far left, you see people who are eager and willing, and then confident, cautious and curious, doubtful, and the wary. And then the question is of these people, how confident do you feel about the source, it, who is providing the information? And libraries are at the top. So please note that this is, no, this is not by the American Library Association or something within our industry. This is a Pew research. And so the fact that we are listed across the board as number one, I think is pretty telling that, that we are viewed in our communities as a credible source. The second one there is family uh, health care providers, and then it drops off really quickly after that. Then you've got local uh, news organizations, um, government. And I think it's interesting how social media is down there to second to last. It's pretty low, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, although if you look at the footnote, you probably can't see it. But the source of data for this is from um, September 29th and November 6, 2016, right before the <laughs> right before the election. So I can hardly wait to see what this looks like next year, if this is going to look any different. But um, it, I think when you take that information, this is another slide from that report. And so the question is, you know, how interested are people in getting training around finding uh, trustworthy news resources? And the answer is at least 50% are interested in doing that. So when you look at these two categories, I think it's interesting to note though, training on how to use online resources to find trustworthy information and training that would help you be more confident using computers, smartphones, and the internet. The reason why that that's important is because so many people receive their news sources from uh, the internet. Right? And so, yes, people, uh, I still read the newspaper every day, but I still get um, news feeds. So I think it's important. And uh, we were having a conversation at the forum about how, uh, like last week, I was getting push it, tweet, 
pushes on like Tom Petty died. And then I went upstairs and I talked to some of my colleagues and they're like, no, he didn't really die. Uh, he went into you know heart failure or whatever, but he's still alive. And then there was a conversation of like, well, what's right? What what is right? So I think that you know, for us figuring out what is credible, I think it affects all of us. So what these two slides tell us is that um, we play a role in this, and that we are viewed as credible. And so that's I, I feel like we're right on target. So. Um, I told you that we did a survey for the PLP libraries about what they're doing around news literacy. And so this slide um, gives us a little bit of information. 99% of the libraries surveyed feel that it's very or somewhat important to help patrons. But 50% of our libraries feel somewhat well equipped. But only a third of us have done programming around news literacy so far. So the the Toolkit, I think, is really going to benefit most of our libraries, right? So we have created a working group to start working on the toolkit. So there's five libraries that right now that are participating, Santa Clara City, Santa Clara County, Oakland, Burlingame, and Palo Alto. And so if you are interested in this, uh, come see me afterwards. One of the things that we want is we want people to test the toolkit once it's developed. We have even had some of the academic libraries said, can I test the toolkit? Of course you can test the toolkit. So um, Adam and Emily are going to talk about some of the programs that they have done already around fake news. And, um, and then after all of this, I think we're going to join in a moderated discussion with Nathan and these two groups to talk about these issues. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Emily Week. Um, I really love this conference. I just want to say thank you to PLP for putting it together. It's really nice to see what everybody's doing and to talk to other librarians. I, I love how local it is. Um, so I'm here to tell you about what we've done at Oakland in regards to fake news programming. And I'm going to not forget to advance my slide. I also always have to confess I get very nervous. I know everybody does, but I, I am one of the nervous people. Um, so after the election, our administration asked us to come up with fake news programming that include hi included highlighting our resources, such as unlimited access to the New York Times Online, which you can access at openlibrary.org forward slash NYT72. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> my colleagues Amy Sani, Christine Ionari, and I worked on a repeatable, interactive 60 to 90 minute program about fake news. Um, we put together a curriculum and exercises, which you can access at the, uh, the site listed there, oaklandlibrary.org slash fake news materials. And between January and mid-September, we've run four workshops for the public and one for staff. Um, so we don't have an extremely robust culture of adult programming, so our attendances were kind of modest. Uh, the first workshop we did on the 25th of January, and we had six people. Um, the second workshop we did on February 4th, and we had 11 attendees, and that actually included a lot of teachers and other librarians, the people that were very interested in the like, emerging topic, how are we teaching it. Um, then we repeated the program on the 22nd of April to a, a very small audience of three. Um, we did a staff training, and 13 staff members, primarily librarians, came. And the goal of the staff training was to be able to push the program to other branches. Um, so one of our librarians who came, Allie Hack, uh, was said, oh yeah, I want to do that at Rockridge. Um, and in mid-September, we that was our first attempt to repeat the program somewhere else. Um, and we had six people. Um, so uh, personally, I like to keep adult programs at about an hour, but we had a lot of content and passion. So we experimented with doing the up to 90 minutes, um, but the curriculum was designed to be very interactive. Uh, we had three main exercises. We did a brainstorming exercise on what is fake news. We also talked about topics such as bias and um, editorial perspective. We had an, uh, a sort of a traditional news literacy uh, exercise where we had people evaluate news articles. We gave them paired articles and a worksheet to sort of uh, figure out which one was fake and which one was real. And the secret was they both had elements of both because news is complex. 
Um, and then we did a grid exercise, which is based on uh, this news quality grid designed by uh, Vanessa Otero, who I think is a, I'm not gonna say what she does because I forget. Um, but it's basically the y-axis is uh, sensationalist to critical or analytical, and the x-axis is left or liberal to conservative. And then you, um, we had people write on post-its where they get their news, everything from the New York Times Online, which you can access for free and limited uh, by going to oaklandlibrary.org forward slash NYT72. Um, <laughs> to uh, Facebook or my Uncle Bob or uh, you know, Breitbart or you know whatever newsletter. So we had people pick all their sources, good ones and bad ones, place them on the grid, and then move them around, um, and then talk about it. Um, and then at the end, we did that brief section on OPL resources, um, our databases, our unlimited access to the New York Times online, oaklandlibrary.org forward slash. <laughs> NYT 72, NYT 72, okay. Um, so some of the strong points of the workshop were the great discussions. Uh, so because we focused a little bit less on traditional literacy, literacy skills, things like uh, the crap test, we focused more on getting people to just talk to each other and to interrogate their own uh, news habits. As we were speaking about earlier, the strength of the public library is our ability to get multiple perspectives in a room to talk to each other. So um, this program was really good at doing that. Uh, in the Bay Area in particular, I think some people have a real hunger to be able to discuss topics like this, to discuss the topic of fake news, to do it in a safe space, and to do it also in a space that's a learning space. Um, so we can provide that as libraries. And so, um, while these smaller discussions, the high-touch programming, is extremely valuable, you do also have to ask yourself, um, how do we reach more than six people at a time? Um, how do we reach a wider audience, and how do we get to the people that aren't self-selecting as, I am interested in fake news? Um, so, one thing we're trying is a passive program, and this is based on the news quality grid that I talked about earlier. Um, so people write sources on the post-its and then uh, move it around. And there's also like a little comment book where they can talk about the experience. Um, so we're trying it at the main library branch where I work and also at Rockridge. Um, and our favorite post-it so far is the one that says Reddit and then sorry <laughs> in parentheses. <laughs> um, the one at Rockridge has been up for about a week, so I asked Allie to, um, what she thought. And I'll read you her email. She said, um, what I noticed is that people mostly didn't move other people's post-its. The exception is the one that lists several sources, such as KPFA, Truthout, New York Times Online, uh, etc. And that started out in the bottom left corner, and someone moved it up to the, squal the quality scale, but not the bias scale. People stopped to look at it, especially as more post-its went up, but not many people stopped to interact with it further. It was across from the ref desk. I wonder if people felt they were being observed by staff? Maybe another location would have had more or different participation. Uh, she says, I expected comments at, on it at the desk, but as, as far as I remember, no patrons mentioned it to me at, at all. Oh yeah, and notably, there's nothing at all on the far right of the grid. That's the conservative side of the grid. Um, so one thing I'm considering now is like maybe we make laminated cards that are already printed with the sources and people might feel freer at moving those around. Um, so, I hope to have uh, talked about the fact that we're in this sort of iterative process of what works, how do we reach people. Um, we know that fake news is not new. Um, I recently learned from Reddit, actually, and I'm not sorry, um, <laughs> about the Kong Mountains, which is this fictitious mountain range that appeared on maps of Africa from 1798 to the late 1800s. Um, and despite doubts and repeated failures to actually find the mountain range, it took nearly 100 years to declare them fictitious and take them off the maps. So um, what is new in our landscape is the speed of communication and the fact that we're migrating from print to digital culture and that journalism and reporting is changing. So what libraries, I think, need to do is help folks navigate that change. And I think that there are a lot of really rich possibilities and ways that we can do that and ways that we can work together to do that. Thank you. Two bottles of water, here we go. 
Okay, so, uh, hi, I'm Adam, and I have seven minutes, okay, less than I thought, to do um, three hours worth of programming. So over the summer, we did three presentations, one on fake news, one on conspiracy theories, and then a fake news game show. Okay, so I started out with this uh, question, this humorous question, where does chocolate milk come from? Raise your hand if you think it's from brown cows. Okay, two people, great. The funny ones, I hope. Um, so we talk about fake news. What is fake news? Everybody's throwing that term around. So you really got to open it up for discussion um, when you're talking to your audience about fake news and cover a lot of different types of misleading and false information. Um, people are really definitely confused out there as to the term uh, fake news and what exactly is fake news. So we show them examples of fake news. Here's just some straight up fake news websites written and created just for the purpose of making a little bit of money. And then there's all kinds of examples here um, that we go through. I have lots of examples I would love to share with you all if you ever want any examples. Including satire, a few minutes to laugh at that one. There you go. Franks. Okay, conspiracy theories. A lot of a huge connection between fake news and conspiracy theories that we'll talk about. Who makes the fake news? Not a very diverse group up there, uh, but diverse motivations. Um, some just want to make some money. Some are conspiracy theorists. Um, you can also make your own fake news, live in your own reality. We look at technology and how technology, of course, has helped proliferate uh, uh, the spread of fake news, um, including that a lot of young adults get their news from Facebook, for example. We trace an article from a parody website uh, through Facebook and Russian TV and on to Fox News. We look at the impact of fake news, how the top 10 fake news stories outcirculated the top 10 mainstream stories on Facebook leading up to the election. It's a BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed's done some great work on this, ironically, maybe. Um, impacts of fake news. Somebody went into a pizza parlor looking for the, um, you know, the child sex ring run by the Clintons. There's a lot about the Clintons. Anybody with Pizzagate? Okay. Um, the Russian interference uh, with the election, um, their fake news. Uh, way back in just a few years ago, they started with a fake WhiteHouse.gov petition, um, pretending that people from the United States were petitioning to give Alaska back to Russia, and they got some signatures. <laughs> uh, we look at solutions. So this is kind of a sticky wicket, because how are we going to solve this fake news problem? Um, is it going to be the responsibility of the tech companies? Who's going to be the gatekeeper of this stuff? Brings up issues of censorship, intellectual freedom, um, free speech. And so there's new policies at Google and Facebook. Um, you can get Snopes results in the search results. You can report a fake news story on Facebook. I like that this guy says, if I can't tell if something is fake or not, it's my fault for being an idiot. Uh, browser plugins, education, a debate about whether people should be uh, educated or if the tech companies should take more action. A nutritional label is one idea from this guy. Um, so, you know, again, the debate about who would make that nutritional label, who would be in charge. I gave them 16 things to look for. So helpful. Um, <laughs> I, I did this at Kiwanis. Um, we, I had to narrow it down to, to 20 minutes. So I made, gave them six things, and now I'd be happy if they just asked these basic questions. Who wrote it? Who's publishing it? And who's telling the story? So you're looking for who's the author, who the journalist is, what um, publication is um, putting it out there, and then what the source is um, involves some critical thinking. And then we look at, um, so just some examples of each of these ways to go through um, and analyze news. Being aware of your own bias, there's spicy, saying whatever is employer, you know, wants them to say. Obviously, that can't possibly be true. Uh, Fact-checking organizations are a great tool, but what about those of us who think that that's all fake news and there's a lot of that out there? There's fake news pretending to be real news. This one definitely looks like ABC News, so you have to be um, able to read a URL, look at homepage uh, aesthetics, find an about us section on the web page. If you can find a disclaimer, then that's a real key. And source analysis is where things get complicated. You have to do definitely some critical thinking. OK, three minutes. Accountability, so a newspaper will publish corrections and fire people for getting it wrong. OK, uh, our next talk was conspiracy theories. Why conspiracy theories? 
fake news and conspiracy theories are very closely related. Um, people are much more likely to believe a um, fake news article if they're a conspiracy theorist. And so conspiracy theories have been going on a long time, important to understand. Uh, here's some characteristics of conspiracy theory. So you know when you're chasing a conspiracy theory, um, it's an unanswered question, almost cannot be answered. This book here, Suspicious Minds by Brotherton, sorry that got a little weird there. Um, that's, I recommend that to everybody to help you understand some of our patrons kind of information seeking behavior and help our patrons understand their own biases and the biases of the, their families. Um, I have 9-11 truthers in my family. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're all conspiracy theorists. To some extent, we're, um, a lot of us, studies have found that 80-something percent of people believe in some kind of conspiracy theory. Why do we consp um, uh, theorize? Um, not because we're lazy or stupid, um, and it's actually, um, you know, we're curious intellectually, and you don't want to find answers, and we question everything, so it's like the Enlightenment. Some contemporary conspiracy theories are really important to understand, so you understand the news and what you're reading. So anything tied to the Clintons and the child sex rings and the body counts and the murders, um, that's all but a long-running conspiracy theory. So we take a deep dive into the Seth Rich conspiracy theory. Okay, so back to the brown cows. So this infographic appeared and uh, on social media, it's in some news stations, some we know and love, right? How many people think 7% of Americans think that chocolate milk comes from brown cows because they're stupid? How about because we're so disconnected from our food, we live in these urban centers, we don't know, we don't know where our food comes from? Okay. How many people think that this is a fake survey done by the dairy organization to get attention and published in, okay, group number three is right. It's fake. And they said it was, when they were finally confronted by a professor, they said it was for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> Question they asked, which is kind of misleading, 48% said, I don't know. <laughs> okay, then finally the game show. Split people into two groups, and we want them to ask us clues about the articles that we show them. Those clues are who wrote it and what is their bio, who published it, Can you, what's the about us page or disclaimer say, and then what about the sources in that article? So I don't think we have time for many of these, but what do you think about this? Fake, true, real? There you go, it's a whale under a boat. So what clue would you want to know to know if this is fake or real? Ask me a question. Do you want to know the About Us page, who's NTD Life? Sure, NTD Life, they endeavor to be the world's go-to home for witnessing and sharing the capacity for the human spirit. Um, and basically they tell you that a lot of people are capturing things on their iPhone, so they're going to take those things and publish them. Hmm. Okay, how about the author or photographer? I'm going to Google D for design. Is that what you would do, recommend? Yeah. Say yes. Yeah. There we go. And there's his Instagram page. Okay, so the answer is? Uh, NTD, what does it stand for? I do not know what it stands for. Exactly. <laughs> right. Well, a lot of people don't know what NPR means. Okay, a man snaps a picture on top of a raccoon. A uh, raccoon on top of a gator. This is at a news station. I'm going to say this is true, fake. Real, looks real. Okay, so this one I can, uh, I'll tell you that the answer to this one is the source. Um, let me read it to you. A, a Palatka man, this is in Okala, Florida, uh, said he snapped a picture of a raccoon on top of an alligator in the Okala National Forest Sunday morning. Richard Jones said he and his family were walking along the Oklawaha River watching alligators when his son walked through some palm fronds to get a good picture. Jones said his son must have startled the raccoon, which stumbled toward the water and hopped on top of the alligator that was nearby. Jones was able to quickly take the unique photo before the raccoon scurried back on land. I snapped a lucky picture right away when the gator slipped into the water and before the raccoon jumped off and scurried away. Without the context, you'd think the raccoon was hitching a ride across the river. Pretty amazing, Jones said in an email. Definitely the photo of a lifetime. So what's the source? Richard Jones, Richard Jones. In an, in an email, if you were the news, would you publish Richard's photograph? No, you wouldn't, but they did. 
So it's, it's fake. Richard Jones did not. This is fake. He would not respond to any comments or follow-ups. Fake person. Um, and so I'm going to end here because I'm over time. Um, but this is an example. This is a National Geographic photo. Dramatic photograph appeals to be real, experts say. Um, this is one where they actually had a lot of experts that they talked to and examined whether or not um, this bobcat could actually hunt for a shark. And uh, so we're just going to guess that that one is, is real. There's a bio of the journalist and, of course, about us page for National Geographic. I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you, everyone.